Hi everyone and welcome back to History of Sexuality. Previously in class, we talked about the emergence of courtly love in early modern Europe. This week, we're going to stay in Europe and move ahead a little bit to the 18th century, the century that brought us the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, the French Revolution, and the beginnings of industrialization. However you look at it, there was a lot going on in the 1700s, and among the various things that changed in European countries during this century were the ways that people understood and experienced gender, sex, and sexuality. The goal of this lecture is to introduce you to some of these changes, and to begin doing this, I want to take us back to the second week of the semester when we read an article by David Halperin called Is There a History of Sexuality? Remember that article? It's been about a month since we read it, so I'll forgive you if you don't, but so as to jog your memory, let me remind you of its first paragraph, which begins as follows. Quote, Sex has no history. It is a natural fact, grounded in the functioning of the body, and as such, it lies outside of history and culture. As this quote indicates, for Halperin, sex lies in the domain of nature. It is a simple, somatic fact. While sexuality has changed over time, Halpern argues that sex has not. It is universal and timeless, an eternal truth stamped on us by biology. When Halpern wrote these words in 1989, he was reiterating what was the conventional wisdom among scholars of gender and sexuality. In particular, he was articulating one of the fundamental tenets of feminist scholarship, which, since the 1970s, had insisted that sex and gender were different things. Today, this might not seem like a very radical idea, but at the time, the commonly accepted wisdom was that one's gender flowed naturally from one's sex. Criticizing this position, second-wave feminists of the 1970s argued that gender was learned behavior, something shaped by culture and driven by social norms. By contrast, sex was biological, something grounded in our very natures and uninfluenced by culture. Thus was born the sex-gender binary, which taught that sex and gender are opposites, the first biological, the second cultural. Only a year or so after Halprin published his article, scholars began to challenge the idea that sex has no history. Post-structuralist scholars like Judith Butler have argued that sex is no more natural than gender, and from the 1990s to the present, others have joined her in contending that both gender and sex are socially constructed phenomena. At first glance, this might seem like a really weird thing to say. After all, from the beginnings of recorded history, most of the world's major civilizations have divided people into two sexes, male and female. The fact that this seems to be the universally accepted way of classifying human bodies would suggest, as Halpern argued, that sex is a biological fact, not a cultural construct. Given this, we might ask, how could maleness and femaleness be anything other than the undeniable reality of human existence? How could sex possibly be a social construct? What evidence has been put forward in favor of this view, and how convincing is it? So, to start, on what grounds do scholars make the argument that sex is socially constructed? To begin answering this, we need to say that the division of humanity into two sexes has happened despite the long-standing recognition that there have always been some people who cannot easily be categorized as either male or female. The ancient Greeks called these individuals hermaphrodites. Today, we use the term intersex to describe individuals whose sexual anatomy 
and or genetic makeup defy easy categorization as male or female. There are many different chromosomal, hormonal, or genital variations that fail to align with typical definitions of male and female, and while estimates for how widespread each of these are vary, overall, intersex individuals may account for as much as 1.7% of the total human population of the Earth. Historically, Western societies have responded to the intersex phenomenon by devising various means for determining the quote-unquote true sex of the individual in question. That is to say, instead of taking the existence of intersex individuals as evidence of the inadequacy of the sexual binary, scientists have typically seen these individuals as errors as mistakes in need of correction. The most widely used protocol for treating intersex people was developed by John Money at Johns Hopkins University in the 1950s. Money, interestingly, was actually one of the first people to articulate a constructionist position on sex. Putting forward an idea as to how intersex children should be raised Money and his colleagues made the bold suggestion that gender identity was a product of nurture, not nature, and that, as such, intersex children could come to be men or women regardless of their biological features. So long as they were raised as a man or a woman from an early age, Money argued, intersex individuals could live as whatever gender they or their parents wanted. At the same time, however, Money feared that parents would want their children's sexual anatomy to match their assigned gender, and so as to assuage parental anxieties, he developed a method of determining the quote-unquote true sex of intersex infants that was based on genital anatomy, specifically phallus size. His system of phallometrics was incredibly crude. Anything shorter than 2 centimeters was a clitoris. Anything larger than 2.5 centimeters was a penis. And anything in between was unacceptable. What this meant, to give an example, was that a genetically male child with a stretched penile length of less than 2.5 centimeters at birth would be classified as a female with surgical interventions conducted with the aim of removing testes, creating a vagina, and the like. Money's protocol reigned through the 1990s when intersex activism led to its abandonment. Two things are notable in all of this. First, Money's phylometrics relied upon a number of cultural assumptions for determining maleness and femaleness. There was no scientific reason for saying that phalluses shorter than 2 centimeters were a clitoris and that those larger than 2.5 were a penis. For example, we know that if allowed to retain their testes, some men with micropenises may be able to father children. At no point did Money's team consider these things. Instead, they were driven by a belief that in order to count as a, an acceptable penis, this organ would have to be big enough to be readily recognizable as a real penis, whatever that is. The decision about where to place boundaries on acceptable levels of anatomical variation was made on the basis of cultural ideas about what a penis should look like, not scientific ones. In that sense, we can say that sex is a social construct. And secondly, on a broader level, the very phenomenon of intersex bodies reveals that our two-sex system is simplistic. To state the obvious, not everyone is obviously either male or female. And often, it is cultural ideas and social expectations that drive the process of sexual differentiation, not the other way around. As evidence of this, consider some specific examples. We think that men are hairier, 
And so, women engage in hair removal practices to ensure this. Or, we think that women are less muscular, and so, when men go to the gym, they lift weights so as to live into this social expectation. Indeed, in many ways, our social expectations produce gendered bodily effects. It is clear in these instances that culture precedes biology. Just like our genders, our bodies are things inscribed with social meanings. Bodies that challenge the sex binary make the constructed nature of sex more apparent. But the process of socially constructing sex occurs as much for intersex people as it does for those who are unambiguously male or female. Indeed, as the work of historian Thomas LeCour has shown, the very idea that humanity is divided into two opposite sexes, male and female, is a historical construct. As his book, Making Sex, contends, for much of the history of Western civilization, male and female bodies were seen as fundamentally alike. Instead of two sexes, in ancient Greece, there was one sex, with a male variant and a female variant. Importantly, in this one-sex model, the differences between male and female forms were seen as differences in kind, not in degree. Thus, female bodies were simply less developed versions of the male body, inferior but not fundamentally different. Western understandings of bodily sex were built on the idea of genital homology. The penis and vagina were said to be structurally equivalent and were arranged along a vertical hierarchical axis in which female reproductive organs were simply a less perfect version of those possessed by males. In the one-sex model, it was thought that during sexual intercourse, both men and women produced seed. Thus, in order for conception and pregnancy to happen, both partners needed to experience orgasm. There was thus both equality in anatomy and physiology, for as the one-sex model taught, there was no fundamental difference between having a female body and having a male body. And interestingly, as a consequence of this belief, the ancient Greeks believed that the boundaries between maleness and femaleness were so porous that it was actually possible to spontaneously undergo a sex change. Indeed, in the Hippocratic medical text called Epidemics, there is a story of exactly this happening. In it, a woman named Phaethusa, who is both a wife and a mother, stops menstruating after her husband is exiled. Afterwards, the text reads, she experienced pain in the joints, and following this, quote, her body was masculinized and grew hairy all over. She grew a beard. Her voice became harsh. And though we did everything we could to bring forth menses, they did not come, but she died after surviving a short time. As LaCour has it, it was not until the 18th century that our modern two-sex body came into existence. It is for this reason that up until around 1700, there were no specific terms for female anatomy. The words vagina, ovary, and uterus only became part of the Western medical lexicon in the 18th century. As this makes clear, the basic idea of the penis and vagina being different is an 18th century invention, one that replaced earlier ideas of them being the internal and external versions of the same organ. The thing we learn here is that the maleness or the femaleness of a body does not derive directly from the body itself. Gender, in other words, precedes sex. LaCour's theories about the historical construction of sexual difference have fascinated scholars ever since his book came out, and in our first discussion of the week, we're going to have an opportunity to look more closely at the argument he makes about the transition from the one-sex body to the two-sex body. But before we get there, I'd like us to stop and think about what we've learned so far. This idea about sex being a social construct is quite counterintuitive, and it is a lot to take in. So, I have three questions for you here. They're on the screen. 
When you've got some answers, head over to our discussion board. I look forward to seeing your remarks.